Speaking of demonology and speaking of symbols, um, could you say a little bit about this symbol? I, I, I mean, I, I hesitate to have it up too long. I just happen to be very, very sensitive as, as just my, my wiring is such that, uh, again, I don't think symbols are neutral. Symbols are never neutral. We are symbolic creatures. We're, as far as we know, we're unique amongst all sort of living beings in that we create symbols which have meanings that transcend the very sort of materiality of, of, of I mean, they, they transcend them way beyond. And and some something apparently simple as an inverted pentagram actually has very deep, I would say, right from a traditional uh, theological metaphysical point of view, it has deep implications, deep reverberations, in fact. Uh, but yeah. Well, look, you're an academic, so you know you're particularly sensitive, you know, in in a in a sensible way about the power uh, 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 of symbols. Uh, and the pentagram is is I think we talked about before we got on air about uh, you know inverted uh, inverted crucifix and stuff like that. You know, these are powerful symbols of, you know, the darker side of, uh, of uh, metaphysical thought. And uh, again, these kind of paraphernalia, which, you know, probably when I was a kid in, in, in American culture would have been extremely, you know, frowned upon uh, as well as, as mocked. Uh, now, now, you know, to some extent, uh, you know, they, they, they have a little bit of a place in the mainstream. Uh, again, wouldn't, one shouldn't uh, exaggerate uh, the prevalence of this stuff and, and, and of Satanism in general, but it, uh, it, it adjusts. It adjusts. And, and what is Satanism? Could you say a little bit? I mean, I, I was having a discussion with a friend yesterday, uh, just by chat, um, that she was uh, arguing, I think rightly so, she, she showed her proof of you know, uh, the sources that Satanists aren't necessarily uh, Satan worshippers and there, there are a lot of atheistic Satanists and I think the, the, the church, the Satanic church, or Satanic temple, I forget which one, they at least publicly, they say they're atheistic and they have certain values that that ring true from a humanistic point of view. But could you, could you say a little bit about Satanism? What is it, broadly speaking, historically? Well, you know, the, the the flip answer is Satanism is a word that people use differently, ah, yes, and there yes. is certainly a wide spectrum yes. of uh, people who you know call themselves Satanists or characterize as Satanists who you know, regarded as, as harmless. Uh, there are theistic <laughs> Satanists, and strange to say, there are this category of people who even call themselves atheist Satanists. Right, very interesting, yes, yes. I think they're even, you know, to show the incoherence of the human mind, I think they're, yes. even, they're, they're even Satanists who say, well, I don't really believe in Satan, but I, I'm a Satanist. So, you know, there, there's a certain, it There's reminded a me incoherence to. Yeah, well, I, to, I, I thought so to interrupt, but it uh, it occurred to me. Uh, I I thought I can help but think of atheist Christians, like people self-identify as, as being atheist Christians. So, right. Yeah. Right. And and so there's this wide spectrum, and then there are people who might be described as as dabblers or you know innocent. Uh, almost innocent teenagers who, you know, use it for shock value and effect as a kind of adolescent rebellion. But again, I'm, I'm in the unusual position of having met and talked to, uh, strangely, some of them, you know, want to talk to me. Uh, about their beliefs and uh, you know I'm aware too that there there are serious uh, Satanists uh, I would describe the committed Satanists who are often more clandestine in their habits but they they unequivocally seriously worship Satan 
And as we were talking about before, it can sound like, well, aren't we dealing with either stupid or superstitious people? You know, trust me, some of these people are quite intelligent and they absolutely believe they are, you know, getting favors in return, just as, you know, the pagans throughout history who sacrificed to gods and goddesses, uh, they thought they were getting something in return. Um, the, the ancient mythology around gods and goddesses uh, often portrayed them as mixed figures who certainly had a malign side to them as well. And, you know, often were portrayed mythologically as petty and, and all these kinds of envious, these kind of things. So they unwittingly, in my opinion, and I think the, the ancient Hebrews, you know, picked this up more explicitly than any other ancient subculture. Uh, they eventually, as did the Christians and, and much of the Islamic world, uh, began to interpret the, the pagan deities of veiled, you know, figures of, uh, of, of, of demonic nature. And, and in your own um, sort of experience um, experiences, you've been uh, you've been a practicing psychiatrist for more than two decades. More, I mean, nearly three decades, even more so. And uh, and and you've been an advisor to the Catholic Church. Um, it, could you say a little bit about that? Do you it's sort of the role that we've oh, you that know, I tell history. people, I've told you individually, yes. Hassan, that everything I've done in this field, I was asked to do. It's not like I went out and volunteered to get involved in this. I mean, I developed an academic interest in it, to be sure, and have written about it. But basically, all my, my experience, uh, I know my former chairman uh, of psychiatry had said once, I'm probably the physician who has seen more of these cases than anyone in history. And in part, that's because people, you know, you know, I've traveled and done things on Zoom and stuff, and, and you know, people have sought me out. And uh, eventually, you know, people asked me to write, write the book, which was the compendium of my uh, experiences. But all these things we're talking about, you know, Satanism, neo-pagans, etc., uh often you know get involved and in, uh, immersed or become attacked uh in ways that the uh secular culture calls the calls the paranormal uh, and so i will see these people who claim to be attacked by evil spirits or sometimes just have visionary experiences of evil spirits and these evil spirits getting back to what we were just talking about, will sometimes identify themselves, even in contemporary times, as gods and goddesses. You know, I had a, I had a guy who came to my office who was clearly possessed, and, you know, possessed people generally have their very coherent, rational side. Obviously, I'm expected to make sure that they're not just psychotic and suffering from delusions or hallucinations and this gentleman you know there's no question he was unequivocally possessed and he would say um and i heard some of the some of the evil spirit voices come out of him uh and he said to me uh by the way zeus is also in touch with me and oh wow he, he said, do you want to talk to him? Because he felt he could allow oh. Zeus by his light to manifest itself. Oh, wow. And I said, no, I don't particularly want to talk to him. Because yeah. by that point, I had realized that he was being besieged by evil spirits who were just lying. And that's what evil spirits do. They often pretend they're 
you know, famous figures, warriors, dead souls, and gods and goddesses. Just as a very prominent example from history would be the Delphic Oracle. The Delphic Oracle would go into a trance and the voice of Apollo would emerge from her, would have access to this amazing knowledge. And it's because she voluntarily, usually a virgin, you know, girl in the area, peasant girl, would allow herself to become temporarily in a voluntary basis possessed. Now, like everything else in life, and you're aware of this too, as a student of, uh, you know, these phenomena, you know, there are a lot of theories about it, you know, well, maybe they were drugged, maybe they were, you know, experiencing vapors at Delphi, but, you know, to me, as someone with so much experience in this area, uh, I could say unequivocally that these oracles, there was another one at, at Dodona in, in modern Turkey, uh, who was another oracle who claimed Zeus was speaking to her, and it was a very similar thing, and people came from all over the world. And, and, and people even, you know, generals and high officials of, you know, Imperial Rome would come to get knowledge from this woman, these women, and, you know, there, there, we, there you go. There's uh, uh, the Delphi uh, Shrine, which uh, I've also visited, and uh, not, in, not in great shape, but uh, still striking. And, um, you know, I always tell people, people don't travel in the old days from Rome to you know, mainland Greece at Delphi, unless they think they're getting some valid knowledge. And that valid knowledge, which we call in Latin, Latra, L-A-E-T-R-A, is precisely what people are seeking for when they go to fortune tellers, some of whom are frauds, but some of them have this amazing capacity to reveal, you know, hidden things, which is the translation of Latra. And in the same way, one of the criteria that we use for valid possessions is Latra. You know, they have to have, you know, hidden knowledge, be speaking in foreign languages that the person has no idea themselves, exhibit, you know, abnormal strength or, or bodily manifestations that are super, that are, you know, preternatural. Uh, these are precisely the kind of things that are not caused by naturalistic uh, reasons and they're, they're why we can successfully diagnose people in the first place as, a, as suffering from something like possession.